You are now listening to Apothic Career Talk, a podcast aiming to widen your career perspectives and enable you to take informed career decisions by leveraging pharmacy role models experiences. I hope you enjoy and subscribe. Welcome to a new episode of Apothic Career Talk podcast. Today I'm joined by Professor Sharif Khalifa, the Dean of Gulf Medical University in the United Arab Emirates. For those of you who don't know Professor Sharif Khalifa yet, he received his Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy at King Saud University in Saudi Arabia back in 1986, and his PhD at the University of Mississippi in the USA in 1994. Professor Khalifa joined Suez Canal University, Mesr International University, and Qatar uh, University in various academic and administrative roles. He was a Fulbright Scholar at Georgia State University in 2001 and adjunct faculty with the School of Pharmacy at the University of Mississippi between 2001 and 2005. Professor Khalifa joined the Gulf Medical University in August of 2017. Under his leadership, the PharmD program received accreditation by the UAE Commission for Academic Excellence, the the CAA, and certification by the U.S. Accreditation Council for Pharmacy Education, ACPE. During his tenure, the Master in Clinical Pharmacy and the Master of Science in Drug Discovery and Development programs both received accreditation by the CAA. Professor Khalifa is currently the Dean of the College of Pharmacy and the Vice Chancellor for Global and Institutional Effectiveness at Gulf Medical University in the UAE. Under his leadership, Gulf Medical University received international institutional accreditation by QAA, the quality assurance agency that accredits higher education institutions in the United Kingdom, and he currently serves as the chair for the U.S. Accreditation Council for Pharmacy Education International Commission. Welcome to Apothe Career Talk, Professor Sharif. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hamza, for the kind introduction. Pleasure having you with us. So you've had uh, an impressive journey so far, and your insights will certainly be beneficial for our listeners. So to get things going, can you go back in time and share with us the early beginnings of your career after graduation? Well, as you mentioned, I graduated from King Saud University College of Pharmacy in 1986. It was a a small group of students, so it was easy to become the top of the class in in, in that sense. So I was hired as a teaching and research assistant in the same college. So uh, assisting in research project with one of my professors and teaching undergraduate labs in pharmacognosy, which is mainly phytochemistry and natural products, things of that sense. So I spent I spent two years in the college as a TA and an RA, and and they were really two very good years because I worked with uh, very good people, mentors, and my major supervisor was an excellent research scientist. So in those two years, we published four research articles together, and that was an opportunity for me to learn more about research and to show abilities. And that was helpful for me to get accepted into a PhD program later on in the United States with a full scholarship because of those two years, actually. Wow, impressive. During this phase of transitioning between college to the professional world, have you faced any sorts of challenges at the early beginnings? Or it was a a smooth transition? Well, as I always say, success and achievement is never smooth and is never easy. There's always challenges. Some of them you might expect and some of them you never expect, but they're always coming at you from different places. My initial interest was to join the Department of Clinical Pharmacy, not the Department of Pharmacognosy. And without going into much details, it didn't work because of the chemistry between me and the, uh, and the department chair over there at that time, many years ago. To me, at the young age, it was a disappointment because clinical pharmacy was something new, you can imagine, at that time. 
and it, it was so exciting and everybody was talking about it, etc. but just things didn't work out. So I was pretty disappointed, but my professors at the department of pharmacognosy were very welcoming. And you can understand when you're from the pharmacy background, pharmacognosy represents the ancient of the profession, right? And clinical exactly. pharmacy is the cutting edge. So you're moving from that side, from tomorrow's world to the historic archaic world. Although I loved the people in the department of pharmacognosy, my heart was kind of somewhere else. So it, eventually I adapted myself to the new situation. And after a while, I enjoyed doing the type of research in uh, looking at plants, extraction, isolation determining the chemical structure, looking at biological activity. It was amazing for me. And I decided based on that to do a PhD in that same area, but definitely the beginning was difficult. And this is where your communication skills and soft skills come into play, even as a student, because as a student, the faculty are watching you. They're looking at you. They say, oh, we want this guy to work with us or we, or they say. Well, no, that student is a bit, he has some attitude problem, et cetera. So maybe, maybe in the department where I, I wanted to work, my attitude was not the right attitude in terms of what they think. And that's why I didn't reach where I wanted, but maybe it was meant to be, maybe that was the best thing for me. That's really insightful. This can be related to the majority of pharmacists at the early beginnings of their careers. We all come with different aspirations, with various career goals, yet the, the realities may impose a different scenario, which might not be the initially envisioned one. And sometimes some of us might get stuck, might get into a feeling of discontent, which eventually isn't permanent, but it may be a new opportunity unveiling and the future is much brighter than we initially expected. And I believe that was uh, a similar case to yours at the early beginnings of, of your career. As we see, it's evolved into a more of an inspiring career that can inspire the, the future generation. That's no matter if you have hurdles at the beginnings of your careers, it can unfold the new opportunities. So with the years, your role evolved and you became the dean of the, the faculty of pharmacy. And I'm curious to know what's the scope as a dean and how it's evolved from being a teaching assistant to an academician, to a professor, and now as a dean of faculty of pharmacy. Well, that's a long journey that you are describing, of course. After two years as a TA, I joined the, as I mentioned, PhD program at the University of Mississippi and uh, spent uh, approximately five years in a research lab doing lots of bench type research, etc. And uh, I worked on uh, the discovery of anti-malarial medications and uh, it was a pretty exciting uh, journey. And in graduate school. I have to say, you don't just learn in a research lab. You learn the whole culture of being a researcher, of being a critical thinker, of pre presenting your research in scientific conferences, communicating with different scientists, different people, answering uh, difficult questions, or sometimes saying, I don't know the answer to that question. So graduate school is a full experience. And this is why sometimes I tell my students, especially if you're doing a PhD, go abroad, go to another country, because it's good to have a totally different experience from the one you came out from the undergraduate experience. And I think that was very useful for me. After that, I decided to return back to my home country, to Egypt, as a faculty member in, and again, I served in several institutions, Suez Canal University, Mesut International University, private university, and part-timer in Ain Shams University as well. And basically, whatever I learned in my 
PhD program, what I've seen, I've recorded what I have learned and what I saw and tried to bring back what I thought was good things to the pharmacy education in my own country. Again, that's another challenge because if you want to make changes to anything, anywhere, of course, we all know there is resistance of change. You bring in new ideas, advanced ideas from countries and systems that are more advanced in pharmacy education, and you bring them back home and you face a lot of resistance. And this was a big challenge for me. In the government university, it was all, almost impossible to make the changes I wanted to make. So when they started private universities in Egypt in 1996, that was my opportunity to join one of these private universities I joined in the year 2000. And the private universities were in competition with each other. So some of them were looking for competition through quality. And this is where I said, okay, I have some ideas to improve the curriculum, the quality of education that you will be uh, giving to the students. So the change was not easy, but it was much easier because it was supported by the top management of the university. And I think they saw this kind of competition through advancing quality as a great marketing tool for the institution. And from there, it became easier for me to try and make the changes that I wanted to make in pharmacy education. And in the private institutions, we started doing exchange programs, student exchange. So students from the Egyptian university would go to the United States for clinical rotations and vice versa, faculty development programs and similar things. During that time, I had the opportunity to join another institution, which is Qatar University. They were starting a new a college of pharmacy. I think it was two years into the program and they were looking for an associate dean academic. So I was accepted into that position. And again, it was another learning experience because the founding dean there was from Canada. So he brought in the Canadian uh, type curriculum and the Canadian accreditation agency, which is CCAP or Canadian Council for Accreditation of Pharmacy Programs. And, and usually the associate dean academic is the one who's responsible for most of the creation of the self-study report of answering so many questions, because the questions in many cases are related to the curriculum content, the curriculum delivery, and the curriculum assessment. So it was a great experience for me to learn more about education and uh, accreditation and quality assurance of pharmacy education using advanced standards like the Canadian accreditation quality standards. I think after that, I had an opportunity to be a full-fledged dean, which I thought was exciting because I felt that it would be good to have a leadership position, a full leadership position in terms of a dean. And this is when the opportunity came in 2017 at Gulf Medical University. So I moved from uh, Qatar to United Arab Emirates for this opportunity. And again, challenge is the name of the game. So I looked at the curriculum. And I felt there is so many changes need to be made to this curriculum. And together with a team, a great team of faculty members, we did a total revision of the curriculum and we did something called substantive changes, basically to uh, increase more of the clinical pharmacy and pharmacy practice aspects of the curriculum, including uh, professional skills something called scholarly pathway that we injected into the cu curriculum to enrich the research component in the curriculum. The professional skills uh, required that we create a lab. We did not have a skills lab, so we decided to build a skills lab in the college. And we also built a sterile compounding lab, 
with all the hoods for hazardous and non-hazardous preparations. So these were two major labs that were created in the College of Pharmacy to give the students hands-on and simulated experiences that they will need, whether they're working in hospital or community pharmacy. We submitted our substantive changes to the local accreditation agency, which is the CAA, as you mentioned earlier, and they were accepted. And we received the CAA accreditation in 2018. At the same time, we decided to submit our file for accreditation by ACPE, which is the U.S. organization responsible for accreditation pharmacy programs in the U.S. and internationally. And again, we had a a site visit, complete visit, and they decided to give us certification at that time, which is international accreditation. So uh, everybody got excited about the recognition and the accreditation nationally and internationally. But again, at the same time, we didn't stop there because we believe that once you reach accreditation, accreditation means that you have met the minimum requirements for quality. This is why you're accredited. It doesn't mean that you have reached the maximum because in reality, there is no maximum. There is always room for improvement. There's things that we can do in the curriculum, in the content, in the way we deliver it, in the way we assess the students. All that is there. Improvements are always opportunities for improvements are there. And again, uh, our philosophy is we don't go after accreditation for accreditation. So accreditation is not the goal or should not be the goal. Accreditation is a means to the goal. So the goal is quality. The goal is to produce pharmacy graduates in the society where the college is who can perform and provide pharmacy services up to the level expected in the society from the public and from the health authorities. Because again, if you look at the mission and vision of any college of pharmacy in the region and maybe in the world, you usually will find something on accountability to society. So as faculty members in the College of Pharmacy, we are accountable to society that we should not graduate someone who will harm. Because in health professions, Uh, A mistake means harm to the health of another individual or to the patient. So accountability here becomes extremely important. And this is why we want to make sure that as students go from year one to two to three, et cetera, they are learning. And it's not just about knowledge. It's more about developing the skills and the competencies that will make them effective healthcare team members to make sure that the medications that are being prescribed and administered to each patient are the right ones in the right dose, are the best ones that will give least side effects and be most effective for our patients. So that's basically our philosophy. So this has certainly been um, a long journey, Professor Sharif, as you've uh, taken all these various roles in various countries and institutions. Certainly you've mentioned that challenge is the name of the game, especially when you are trying to bring in innovations and change, there is always a phase of resistance. So I believe your personal soft skills and maybe even technical skills are required for success in such a role. And I'm wondering, what do you consider are qualities necessary for people to succeed at a role similar to yours? Yeah, thank you for this question. The role of a dean of a college is definitely challenging. And I think success is related to the team, to the group of people you're working with. And I always say that the most valuable piece of equipment in the college is the human piece. So human resources, the human element, is the most important element. 
So this means that as a dean, the most important thing is to recruit the right people. And I think recruitment is an art. Sometimes you do advertisements, you look at CVs, etc., and then you miss very good people and you don't hire the ones that fit. So I think number one is the ability to create the right team. Of course, they have to be capable in their area of specialty, whether it's pharmacology, pharmaceutics, pharmacy practice, etc. But at the same time, those who like the idea of change and improvement and are capable of, of putting the, the, the effort and the energy. So basically, you're looking for uh, people who are intelligent and energetic. They're not lazy. But at the same time, you're looking for those with integrity because uh, I'm borrowing this from uh, someone else uh, who said if they don't have integrity, then don't bother about anything else. So I think the, those three elements are extremely important for the, for the people we recruit or hire or, or work with. At the same time, as we meet in the curriculum committee, assessment committee, or whatever committees, giving the chance for, for the people to speak their minds. So as a leader, I should not at least give my opinion first. Basically, listen to all the others. And usually when I do that, I come in the room with a, a certain opinion. This is what I think is right. When I go around the table and I hear from my colleagues, by the end, I don't give them what I thought was right because now I feel that I've heard things that are much better than my own ideas. So basically, my role here is to summarize and create a decision from a collective decision from the input of my colleagues and then say, okay, this is what we're going to do. And in many cases, it's contrary to what I have first thought. Again, I have to say in our meetings in the college, in these committees, we always include students. It's not just for accreditation purposes. The accreditation agencies tell us that we should include students. But because we believe that student input is extremely important in pharmacy education and maybe in any education system in universities and schools. The student perspective is extremely important. This is why I always uh, like to say the students are the beneficiaries or the victims of what we do, right? Because if we are doing a good job, then they are the beneficiaries. If we are making them suffer, right? So we need to listen to them. Does it hurt? Do they understand? Do they like it? Do they feel this course is useful, is useless? Are we, is there redundancy in the curriculum? Is there some component that is extremely difficult where we need to give them some more training? We need to expand the hours of practical, etc. Students provide uh, invaluable uh, feedback to improve the curriculum and the pharmacy education. So basically, a good leader is a good listener. Recruitment and then listening and implementing what the students and the faculty feel is right. Once you can do that, then hopefully you'll be able to make the change and the improvement and success will come. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Considering it's a leadership role, so leadership skills are paramount for success at such a role. And I appreciate your insights about recruitment because maybe sometimes it's an overlooked aspect, but the overall output is really predicated upon the, the quality of the re re recruited personnel. Now, before we wrap up about the career part of your journey, can you recall some highlights of your career journey? Maybe some ups and downs alike, some moments of pride and those where you were really challenged? Yeah, there's so many of them. <laughs> the challenge, the discontent, the difficult situations. They always say people don't resign from a job. They resign from a boss, right? So 
they like the job, okay? They think, oh, I want to be a faculty member. I want to be a professor of pharmacology or the like. So they like the job and they accept it and they start working. Now, if the system they are working in or the person they are reporting to is encouraging them or facilitating their mission, then they will stay and be happy. If otherwise, then they may be forced to leave and find another, another place. So I would say in, in, in every place I worked, of course, we all have bosses. We have people who are, that we report to, etc. I have not always been lucky. Sometimes I was very lucky to have, to be reporting to, to someone who's understanding, someone who's a visionary who believes in the change and the improvements. And because in order to make improvements anywhere, there is linked to a budget. So if you're asking for money, people up in the hierarchy, they don't like that. They want you to say, I will do this, I will do that. But if you start say, asking or requesting funds, then, then it becomes difficult. So. In some cases, and I'm just sharing this because I know students or fresh graduates, they are going to face this as they're very ambitious. They want to do so many things, but choosing who you are going to work with or making sure, even when you go on a job interview, I want to say that the interview is both ways. They are interviewing you to see if you are a good candidate and if you are the right fit for the job. And please remember, you are also interviewing them and you are checking to see, is this the right place for me? Is this the right boss? You know, because you're probably going to be interviewed by your future line manager. And usually at the end of the interview, they will ask you a question like, do you have any question for us, right? I'm sure this has happened with many and it always happens. I always ask that question as well. So the more you understand as a fresh graduate or the like about the people you are going to work with and the system you are going to be part of becomes very important. So you lessen, lessen the suffering, basically. So mainly the challenges were challenges from the system, from not really the system, from the line manager, basically. And, and again, there's a lot of confidentiality here, so I cannot speak in, in more details about exactly what happens. But again, I have to tell you something and, and tell this to the students or graduates. Sometimes being exceptional is a problem. So I'm sure there's so many exceptional pharmacy graduates and pharmacists out there. Sometimes when we're young, we think, okay, if I show them that I'm a genius, then they will hire me. Actually, it, it could be. If you're going to work for me, of course I will hire you. <laughs> but, but if you're for some other managers, it's a threat. Okay, so we have to remember that you could be a threat. If you're, if you are too intelligent and if you are too good, you could be a threat because a manager may say, oh, in a year or so, they're going to replace me. No, I want someone who is obedient, someone who will follow the rules, someone who will keep the boundaries, et cetera, et cetera. And this is why I always say, choose the person you're going to work with. Make sure that person is going to help you grow, give you an opportunity to learn and to grow rather than to try to halt your progress because of a feeling of threat. And I have to say, this is going to happen, okay? Because the managers out there, there are so many different types of them. And it's not very common when you see someone who's interested in your well-being, in your professional development, in your growth, etc. So hunting the right line manager to work with could launch your career and otherwise could really put you in a, in a very stressful situation. That's insightful because sometimes recent graduates and early career pharmacists who are mainly ambitious, who have exceptional skills, 
sometimes maybe they get disappointed for not landing the, the role they were most passionate about. But as you mentioned, that's in many cases, it's not related to the person's skill sets. It's actually some external factors that are affecting such an outcome. In these cases, you mentioned that being exceptional is a problem. And this is where I believe self-awareness from these pharmacists comes to play. It's an important element for them to be confident with their skill set, with their value. They should know their value. And sometimes not being accepted in a role that you are aspiring for, it's not your problem. And it's actually other people's problems. And that should be fine for you as long as you are willing to move ahead and not be paralyzed by such an outcome. And I'm glad that you've highlighted this point. Now, considering that you are an academician, I see it's uh, relevant to discuss pharmacy education and the evolution of uh, the pharmacist's role within the context of the accelerating pace of technological innovation. For some context, during, during the 1900s, pharmacists fulfilled the role of the apothecary where they were involved in the compounding of medications, a role that became less and less prominent with the industrialization of drug production. Then around the 1960s, we've seen the emergence in the North American countries of clinical pharmacy, and the pharmacist's role became more of a therapeutic consultant. And afterwards, around the 1990s, was the birth of a patient-centered practice model known as the pharmaceutical care. And it's getting more and more widespread now across the world. With the 21st century is more of a technological advancement era at an unprecedented rate from automation to mobile technology to now we're seeing the astonishing progress of artificial intelligence. And that's, I believe, is putting us you know, on the cusp of a new era. So in light of uh, the current evidence, I'm curious to know how do you see the pharmacist role evolving in the next 10 or uh, 20 years? Yeah, that's a, a challenging question <laughs> uh, to see the future uh, and, the, and the pharmacist role. I'm sure you will be interviewing others who are in the profession and can probably say a lot more than I can say regarding the changes that are currently happening and, and the projection of the future. I like to comment on the role of pharmacy education and the colleges of pharmacy in coping with those changes, okay? Because the, the problem, in, especially in the Middle East region, and I'm sure around the world, but maybe for us a little more, is that changes happen in the profession faster or much faster than they are happening in the education system. And that's a huge problem because we, what is happening is that we are graduating pharmacists who do not fit the work environment of tomorrow. Because a student who comes into the College of Pharmacy today will graduate after a minimum of five years. So we need to make sure that the courses that we deliver in the curriculum today are still valid after five years, which is very difficult to predict, especially as you mentioned about artificial intelligence and the advancements in health informatics, etc. That's a big challenge. And I think Academia will continue to be dragging behind. And that's part of the problem of resistance to change, that we keep teaching and, and using the same material that we used last year and the year before. And this is not going to be right for our students and for the pharmacy profession. One of the problems that I see in, in pharmacy education, if you want to teach students about informatics. Well, we don't have a, a PhD faculty member who has PhD in informatics. So basically we have pharmacology, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutics, medicinal chemistry, these disciplines. So the issue is 
the acceptance in the world of academia, accepting to have someone from practice come into the college and do the teaching of informatics, maybe a pharmacy director in pharmacy X, in, in hospital X, can, who has developed skills in a certain area, they can come in and teach a course or part of a course. The, the colleges and the faculty members have this resistance to accept someone who does not have the Ph. And this is specifically in the Middle East region. And we've seen that with the introduction of the clinical roles of pharmacists, where clinical phar to be a clinical pharmacist or a clinical specialty really does not require a PhD. Well, I'm, I'm saying here that academia is, is dragging behind and the profession is changing faster than us, the academicians, are capable to grasp and employ in our curriculum. Uh, and again, the resistance to change remains the problem. Uh, we do not want to accept those who do not have PhDs in professorial appointments in the colleges of pharmacy in the Middle East. I know there are exceptions to this, but it needs to be, we need to have more exceptions to that because we know that around the world, there are some programs that give PhD in clinical pharmacy. But in reality, when you ask me, I, I would say, what is PhD in clinical pharmacy? This doesn't make sense. Because clinical pharmacy is a professional degree, like the PharmD is a professional degree. It is a doctorate degree, but it doesn't have the elements of the PhD in terms of thesis type research, etc. But those who have the PharmD and the residency, like PGY1, PGY2, or fellowships, this is the kind of training that is essential for us to be able to teach and train our students to become competent pharmacists and clinical pharmacists. So the idea of accepting the PharmD and residency for professorial appointment is important. And this is why I'm, I'm worried also about the technology, informatics, et cetera, coming into the role of the pharmacist and the colleges of pharmacy will find difficulty in teaching what they don't know. Because as a pharmacologist, I don't know about informatics. Even if I'm a pharmacy practice professor in social administrative pharmacy, pharmacoeconomics, etc. So we should start having more flexibility in bringing in what we call experts. They don't have to have PhDs or masters, but they have the expert experience. And again, it's not just about lecturing on clinical pharmacy or lecturing on informatics. It's about embedding the pharmacy student in the work environment of today. This is why when I look back, when I was uh, in, in pharmacy school in the 1980s, uh, our experience in the pharmacy, in the work environment was very limited. Today, uh, which is great, we can see that there's a, 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 a huge number of hours where students should do in experiential education. So in community pharmacy settings, in clinics, in hospitals, and hopefully the colleges will choose advanced hospitals that have advanced health care with digitalization and uh, informatics and technology, etc. So the students will learn from being part of the environment and will learn from pharmacy practitioners who are doing this job every day. So this is where education needs to partner very closely with practice. Practitioners have to be practitioners and educators. And the educators in the college have to build strong ties and respect and belief that the pharmacy profession will not evolve and will not deliver what it is meant to deliver without the bond between academia and practice. Yeah, this is what I have to say about it. That's really insightful. Since you mentioned the fact that 
academia is oftentimes slower than the advancements in the professional world, that the first year students will be uh, studying for five years and the curriculum needs to stay relevant after their graduation, which might not always be the case since there are some challenges within the academic world itself. As you mentioned previously, students should always be at the heart of the decision-making and uh, they either benefit or suffer from the consequences of academic decisions. Uh, in this case where uh, we see academia slower to adopt the evolution in the professional world, I'm wondering what do you consider are some useful coping mechanisms for students to minimize the impact from suboptimal decisions that are happening at the university level and for them to be well prepared and still be relevant to the professional world, especially with the evolutions happening out there? Well, students have a lot to do. They can. First of all, they need to choose the right college and the right program. In today's world, it's beautiful. You can go to the websites and get a feeling of how progressive is this college, how modern is the curriculum, okay? Especially if you have insight from somebody who knows about the profession. So student, choosing the right program is important. Reputation, sometimes I say ranking and sometimes I feel ranking is not always telling the truth. And that's one thing. Another thing when, as a student, when you enter the program, we are always looking for students with leadership qualities. And sometimes they say leaders are born, not made. And I see this in my own students. Some students are just born leaders. And as we know, leadership here doesn't mean that you have to have a title or a position. It's just something that runs in your blood. And this is what we need in pharmacy students. We need students who will come, go to the dean's office and say, I have a suggestion. I think we should do things in a different way. I think we need this type of training. I think this course needs to be eliminated. So colleges today are giving students the opportunity to voice their opinion and to be part of the decision-making. Students, good students at least, we expect them to come forward and uh, to participate, to contribute, to challenge us, and to say these are changes that need to be made. In good colleges, they will listen to the students and they will make the changes. So I think students from the very beginning, from the choice of the college, from being an active student, looking for opportunities and changes. And once they graduate, and I've seen this in many pharmacy graduates, we tell them the, the slogan of never stop learning and lifelong learning. Although we use those a lot, but they are true. There are so many things that as a graduate, you cannot stop. Because you're already, even after you graduate, you are already behind in some aspects of pharmacy practice if you are in an advanced city or country. So if there's something that you missed, you can always take a course. And in today's world, online courses are everywhere. Or you can take training, some kind of training in hospital X, or Y, Z, etc., and investing in learning what you have missed or in updating your knowledge and skills is extremely valuable because it's going to be an investment. It's not going to be something that you're throwing away, not your time and not your money. So to continue to be on your toes to upgrade and improve. And I've seen this in many of our students. Some students, they choose to stop and just to look for a job. Some students are looking for a job while they are continuously looking for opportunities to learn new things, to uh, acquire relevant skills. Those are the ones who get the better jobs, the higher paying jobs, and those are the ones who reach their goals faster and become more effective pharmacists in society. Lovely, lovely. You've highlighted the fact that students must be 
actively engaged in choosing the right college. Now, let's say for those that are now in a certain university around the world, that's not necessarily offering updated curriculums or those that are relevant with the advancements happening in the professional world. What do you see are some solutions or some coping mechanisms these students who didn't have the chance to go to the best college for them to still be relevant in the job marketplace and keep up with the advancements happening outside? Yeah, I agree with you. The, the reality is that we don't always have the opportunity to go to the best, right? I could be the best student, but I'm, I'm not in the right country. I, I don't have enough funds to do this or that. So we have to take the best possible option of what is available and what I can afford or my parents can afford. So that's the first step again. Okay. So let's look at that. And then at the same time, there is always summer internships. Some students are so active that every summer you will find them in this pharmaceutical company, this hospital, etc., being current in terms of what is happening today, what the profession looks like in, in my country today. And sometimes even the pharmacy profession is, is an interesting one because it differs from one hospital to the other. In the same country, you may find advanced practice in one hospital and only dispensing in another hospital. So again, choosing where I'm going to do my internship. Okay. Of course, the colleges do structured rotations or clinical rotations, etc. But uh, some students on their own can go out and find opportunities for training and learning on their own to update their skills, etc. Uh, the other thing I want to say that uh, a lot of teaching is happening in the college, okay? So the term teaching is a very common term. When you go to the classroom, colleges have so many classrooms, I think, beyond what is needed. Because in the classroom, teaching happens, but not always learning. And that's a key point. Teaching must lead to learning. But in many cases, I have to say, teaching doesn't lead to learning. So teaching and learning is what we should focus on. Because lecturing, in many cases, is about giving the student information, right? And then they take down notes or take the PowerPoint slides and then they memorize. And then you ask the question and then they give the answer. Of course, we all know this is not learning. And there's a good saying that says, don't memorize anything that you can look up. This is a, a good saying. I love it. But sometimes as faculty, we do not help the students do that because we ask them questions on exams closed book exams where they have to memorize. And that's a mistake that many of us are doing. So open source exams should be the future. It's not about memorizing something you can look up. You can look it up in five seconds. Then why do I have to sit all night just memorizing something? So lecture halls, and I see this as the future in pharmacy education. There's less of lecture halls, more of simulated environment and more of the working environment. So basically the hospital should be my classroom or the community pharmacy should be my lab. So this is the place where students should be learning. And probably from day one, and a good percentage of the material that we teach in a classroom, if we give the students the material to read on their own, Research has so shown that about 70% of the material, they can grasp it on their own. And it's only 30% or maybe less where they need in-depth explanation. So what I'm saying is that we should not waste so much time on what they can learn on their own and use the time at the college and the university for discussions, for more in-depth understanding, for building their skills. And all that will lead to a better opportunity to become better pharmacists. So 
back to the, I, I'm sorry that I digressed a lot from the original question, but the, the students themselves, they should look for opportunities like internship opportunities in places where there's advanced healthcare and seek those opportunities. And they always say, keep knocking, the door will open. You can go to one hospital and they say, hey, we, we don't have an opportunity for you, go away. Okay, if you keep coming back or trying different things, the door will open at some time. If you insist, if you are persistent as a student, if you are resilient, you are going to reach your goal. Nobody reached the top. Nobody became CEO because they, they came running after them. They suffered, they tried, they failed so many times, and then the door opened. And this is why we, we are looking for pharmacy students who are leaders, born leaders, leaders who will change the curriculum, who will help us to change the curriculum, okay? We know the rules, they don't have rules, they don't have boundaries, and this is what's beautiful about students. They don't believe in the rules and boundaries. We want them to be leaders because while they're at school, they help us change the curriculum. When they graduate, they make changes and lead changes in the profession itself to better serve their patients and at the same time to be respectable members of the healthcare team. This has certainly been a, a knowledgeable conversation, Professor Sharif. And it's obvious that we can uh, talk about this for hours and hours just to uh, scratch the surface. Since I want this podcast to come with practical and actionable insights for our listeners, and before we wrap everything up, I want to ask you about your uh, favorite pieces of advice, which our audience can use in their own career growth in light of your years or, or decades of experiences, what advice would you give your younger self? Yeah, this is a great question. And uh, I might have touched upon some of these embedded in throughout the conversation. But if I go back to my younger self, or if I'm looking at pharmacy students and fresh graduates, what advice I would give them, there's many things. As a student, I like to tell them, ask questions. I think that's a key thing. Even I tell my younger self that. Because sometimes as students in the college, when we are studying a certain subject, we tend not to study every day. This is the normal students, unless you are a complete uh, genius. We tend to wait until there's exam time. The exam is after one week, and then we... We hibernate at home and bring the books and, and start reading and, and studying, right? Some people do it even just the night before the exam. And I know this is very familiar. So what happens is that you're reading, you're memorizing, and you come across something that you completely don't understand. But there's no time. So you say, okay, I'm just going to memorize it the way it is. And when the exam question comes, I'm going to write uh, what's there. So the more you have of things that you didn't understand, you didn't ask why, because if you don't understand something, you should go to your professor and say, please explain this to me. I don't know why this is the fact or this is so. So asking the question why means you will understand. Because in your career after that, everything you are learning, hopefully, will have an application. So missing on your understanding of why this fact is so or why this observation is happening is extremely important. So asking questions, I think, is a key thing for all the students. I, I remember I was teaching in one of the colleges of pharmacy in Egypt. And I put a, a question on the exam. Uh, students sometimes didn't like my questions uh, because they didn't have the direct memorization. Uh, and, and usually after the exam, the next lecture after the exam or session, I go through the exam and we answer all the questions together. So when I read the question out, one of the students told me, well, I didn't understand this question. But I know that it, it, was, it was about this section of the notes. So I just wrote everything 
in the notes. I put it for you there for you to pick out and give me the mark. I told the student, I remember your paper very well, and I gave you a zero. Of course, he didn't like me. I'm sure he doesn't like me until today. Because it means that w- when you put everything there, it means that you don't know, you don't understand, and you don't know what the question is or what the answer is. So the first advice as a student, this is your opportunity to learn. It means you have to ask questions. The other thing is as you prepare for graduation, you think for your career, you also need to ask questions, but maybe different types of questions. You are lucky because you have around you so many faculty members, senior, junior, some ones who are TAs, some ones who are preceptors, some who are lecturer, assistant professor. So you have so many people around you who have gone through the experience that you are in right now a golden opportunity for you. Once you graduate and you leave that place, these people are not going to be around you. You're not going to see them every day. So take advantage of this opportunity and ask them questions about career. What should I do? You don't have to go to one of them only, not just your favorite. It's good to listen to different professors, different teachers, different practitioners. So they will tell you, I think the best thing is hospital pharmacy. Someone will say, I think the best is medical representative. But when they answer you, the good thing about it, they will have you in mind. They are looking at you as a student. They're looking at your character. You seem to be someone who is very passionate about people, caring, etc. So they may say, I think pharmacy practice in a hospital setting would be very suitable for you because you have that people connection. Some other students don't want to see people, are not great communicators. Then they say, maybe you can do good in research, do some research in drug discovery and become a scientist. You sit in a lab, stay away from people because you're very smart, you're very intelligent, but you don't have that people's character. So again, ask questions to learn the material and the skills. Ask questions of those around you, valuable people around you to guide you on your career and what choices to make and what advice to do. Maybe a third one is, I mentioned it before, is that we have to keep learning. Even if you are professor, full professor, if you stop at that, you stop. But if you keep learning, keep accumulating knowledge and skills, attend conferences, webinars, seminars, it's always a learning opportunity. In today's world, you cannot stop at a certain degree because the competition in the job market is is fierce and it's more difficult than it was when I was a fresh graduate. So the more you show that you are learning and and realizing this is an area where I need to get a course in in pharmacy informatics, maybe not a master's degree, maybe just a a diploma or two months course or something like that. So you look at self-directed learning. This is what I feel I can do, I like to do, and it also meets what the job market in my area is looking for. We had a meeting with the college advisory board. One of the CEOs of a hospital was uh, shouting and saying, we don't want any more dispensing pharmacists. We've had enough of those. We want clinical practitioners, students and fresh graduates. You need to listen to that. Because again, with advancement in technology, we all know that robotics is taking over all this stuff. So areas where there's critical thinking, there's thoughtfulness, there's researching, there's weighing risk benefits, so many clinical decision-making, evidence-based medicine. This is the area where the human element will remain important. The communication, the passion, the relationship with the patient. So you need to listen to, to all your professors and see where do you fit, where your professors can see things in you that you cannot see in yourself. And they've been with you for four or five years. They're watching you. They can feel what you are a good fit for. 
So ask questions and continue to learn new things, self-directed learning, addressing job market needs, following your mentor's advice because they can see things in you that you cannot see in yourself. Absolutely. That was a very wise intervention of yours. And this will certainly be helpful to our listeners to incorporate into their future direction and the current actions that are leading to the evolution of their career and education. What, what about your advice for those who aspire to embark on a career journey that's similar to yours? What would you advise them? I'm not sure if my advice applies only to the academic career. I think it, it applies to any career. I think as we embark on academia or any other career, we should strive to make a difference. This is my philosophy. I don't like to live in the shade or stay in the, in the shade or just do the minimum. And there are so many people out there in different careers who just want to do the minimal and then go home and watch TV or whatever. And we are looking for people in academia or in any other profession or career who are looking for making changes. Because making changes hopefully means improvement. And this is why we are here on this planet, okay? I feel this is why we are here. We are here to to make things better, to build, to change, to advance. And the whole world around us is advancing. Any career we choose, including the academic career, I feel that we should strive to make a difference. So I'm saying that our mere existence as human beings is to make changes, right? And, and it, you look back to the prehistoric ages, you see the caveman and how the world was, and definitely it has changed tremendously. It has even changed in the past 50 years. So your question was, what advice do I have for those who want to embark on a career in academia? And I say that academic careers is very similar to other careers in pharmacy in terms of the kind of advice I would give to anyone. But when I look at academicians, I think academicians have a huge responsibility. Because as an academician, you are impacting a large number of people who are the students. The pharmacist takes care of patients. The academician takes care of students because you are affecting the minds of a large number of students. And this is happening every year. So this year, if you have a cohort of 50 students and next year, another 50 and another 50, the impact that you are having is huge. And these students, one day they are going to come out to the society and are going to be pharmacy practitioners and are going to take care of patients. And we are hoping that they would do benefit in relieving pain and contribute to curing and improving the life of others rather than making mistakes that leads to harmful effects on patients. So. First of all, if you're embarking on academia, you have to feel the importance of this uh, profession, the importance of this mission, the accountability, whether it's accountability to society or accountability to your patients, to your students, the patients of your students when they graduate, basically. So again, staying up to date is a must. Continuing to learn is a must because whatever you teach has to be up to date. Encouraging your students to challenge you. You cannot hinder your students. You want your students to challenge you, to say, we have something different here. I read something the other day on one of the internet resources that is contrary to what you're saying. So you have to give the opportunity for respectful debate and new ideas to come in that are contrary to your ideas. And this is the sign of a good academicians, a good academician that will fulfill their role. 
at the same time as an academician who will become maybe a leader, a department chair, an associate dean, a dean. We are governed by policies and procedures in the university and policies and procedures by accreditation agencies. If we are true leaders, we have to believe that policies and accreditation standards are not set in stone. Policies are made and written so that we can review them and revise them and change them at some point of time. We have to have that confidence because we are the academicians, right? Hopefully we know what is best for our students. If we don't, then maybe we should have someone else do the job. So we ourselves should challenge the policies and the, and the standards in a respectful way for those who wrote the policies and the standards. And it becomes a discussion where we want to improve the whole society. So being an academician is a leadership role in itself from the TA to the lecturer, to the professor, to the dean. So we cannot take things, oh, this is the template says that, the policy says that, we just have to follow it. Of course, I'm not advocating breaking the rules, but I'm advocating is that if we feel that the rule applied maybe 20 or 30 years ago, and it's time to make a change because the world has changed, things have changed, then we have to be advocates for the change. So if you're following me in, in this uh, podcast, you will realize that I use the word change a lot because I really like this word. And I think if we believe in change, of course, change for the better, our whole life will be better. It will be worthwhile and we will all be of service to our families, to our neighborhood, to our society, and our life would have been worth living and worth remembered after we are gone, inshallah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Professor Sharif. This has certainly been an enlightening intervention of yours. The valuable insights you've shared with us will be uh, useful for our listeners' career journeys in terms of getting enabled to take well-informed decisions shaping their future success and i'm really really grateful for you taking the time to share this with us so thank you very much thank you dr hamza for the invitation and for the opportunity i really appreciate it my pleasure thank you for listening i hope this interview has opened up new perspectives for you if you have any questions for our guests, feel free to ask them through the link in the description below. We'll try our best to answer all of your questions or at least the majority of them. In next week's episode, I'll be hosting a pharmacy leader from Australia who has been a community pharmacy owner for 30 years, national vice president of the Pharmacy Guild of Australia, and they played a key role in expanding the scope of practice for pharmacists in Australia. If you don't want to miss another mind-opening interview, make sure you subscribe, and I'll also appreciate it if you let your pharma friends know. Stay tuned and take care.